The main things you need to know about this bacteria is once again, it's a gram-negative diplococci. Uh, it is oxidase positive and there are certain media on which it can be grown. So there's non-selective media such as chocolate agar and we've discussed that previously. And then there's Thayer Martin agar which contains antibiotics and antifungal agents which allow Neisseria to be selectively grown out on the culture media. In terms of the risk factors for a Neisseria gonorrhea infection, there are a number that you may need to look for in the vignette. Typically it occurs in young adults who are unmarried, who are of low socioeconomic status and of a low educational background. They may have a history of a previous Neisseria gonorrhea infection and it occurs in population groups in which the infection rate is high. They may also have a history of other sexually transmitted infections. In terms of the pathogenesis of Neisseria gonorrhea, it has a number of ways in which it causes and induces disease in patients. So on its surface, it has outer membrane proteins and pili which facilitate adhesion and binding to your uroepithelium or mucosal surfaces. It also has IgA proteases, which are enzymes that cleave the IgA immunoglobulins that protect these surface linings. It has an endotoxin in its outer membrane, which facilitates a number of the features of disseminated disease. And finally, one of the other features that uh, Neisseria gonorrhea has is resistance to antibiotics. So over time, it tends to become resistant to a number of the antibiotics that are used against it and to treat it. And this is one of the big problems with treating Neisseria gonorrhea and its evolving um, antibiotic resistance. So most American guidelines advise screening for Neisseria gonorrhea in a number of different ways. Generally speaking, they recommend screening young women, particularly pregnant women, who are at high risk of having Neisseria gonorrhea infection. Those include those with those risk factors that we previously discussed, women between the ages of 15 and 24, uh, especially those who are sexually active. They also recommend screening men who have sex with men and also patients who've had a prior history of an Neisseria gonorrhea infection three months prior. Those patients should have, after three months after the initial diagnosis, a repeat screening test to make sure that the infection has been eradicated or treated. Finally, pregnant women who are at high risk of having the infection should also be screened. So in women, you may see a number of different manifestations of gonorrhea infection. These include cervicitis, urethritis, bartholinitis, pelvic inflammatory disease, and perihepatitis, which is also known as Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Cervicitis is characterized by a mucopurulent discharge associated with abdominal pain. The cervical area may appear inflamed and the mucosa may be friable on examination. Urethritis presents with features of urinary dysfunction. So the patient may present with painful urination, having to go to the toilet quite frequently, known as frequency, and abdominal pain. It's important to note that patients may have no symptoms at all. So they may be asymptomatic with gonorrhea infection. Barotholinitis is inflammation of the Barotholin glands. This may present with perilabial pain and discharge and inflammation of the glands themselves. Pelvic inflammatory disease has a number of symptoms in your vignette that you're looking for. The patient may complain of lower abdominal pain, again, a mucopurulent discharge, and pain during sexual intercourse, which is known as dyspareunia. They may also notice abnormal uh, vag vaginal discharge or bleeding during their menstrual cycles. Finally, on examination, uh, you may elicit uterine tenderness, tenderness rather, or cervical motion tenderness on performing a bimanual uh, examination with a chaperone present. Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome refers to a perihepatitis or an inflammation of the liver capsule that occurs in patients with pelvic inflammatory disease rather rarely, but sometimes is asked in clinical vignettes. The patient will present with a history or risk factors for pelvic inflammatory disease. So they may complain of abnormal vaginal bleeding, pelvic pain, and have those features in examination that we spoke about. 
but they will also have right upper quadrant pain in association maybe with fever, with vomiting, and with nausea. So the key thing is to look for the patient with right upper quadrant pain and think, have they any features or risk factors for pelvic inflammatory disease? There are a number of manifestations of gonorrhea infection in men. These include urethritis, which again presents with that discharge, painful urination, frequency or urgency in terms of going to the toilet. Men may also complain of testicular pain, which typically is unilateral um, and is caused by inflammation of the epididymis. It's important to examine the patient carefully in this setting to rule out other causes of testicular pain, which would include testicular torsion. Finally, in men who have sex with men, you may also get proctitis or inflammation of the rectum. And this presents with patients who have a mucopurulent discharge, who have rectal pain, and they also have inflammation around the actual rectum on examination.